This is Twit. Last Tuesday was another of Microsoft's all too frequent mixed blessing patch Tuesdays. Okay, so first, here's the good news. A total of 97 vulnerabilities of varying severity were patched. And there were also an additional 29 vulnerabilities fixed in Microsoft's Edge browser. Of the 97 non-Edge vulnerabilities, nine were classified as critical and the other 88 as important. Overall, the patches cover Windows and Windows components, Edge, Exchange Server, uh, no surprise there, Office and Offices components, SharePoint Server, .NET Framework, Microsoft Dynamics, some open source software even, Hyper-V, Defender, and the Remote Desktop Protocol, RDP. Dustin Childs with Trend Micro's Zero Day Initiative said, this is an unusually large update for January. Over the last few years, the average number of patches released in January is about half this volume. We'll see if this volume continues throughout the year. It's certainly a change from the smaller releases that ended 2021. Okay, so Microsoft patched 67 bugs last month in December. Now we're at 97. Okay. Now, Microsoft classes a zero-day vulnerability differently than we do here. My feeling is that we need to reserve the term zero-day, which has unfortunately taken hold as clickbait, for a vulnerability which is first discovered when it is observed being used in the wild. The point is that patching that puppy, which is currently being exploited is much more important than patching a problem that's only potentially exploitable and which has been reported responsibly and privately so nobody knows about it except the the, the group that can fix it but microsoft also classifies vulnerabilities that have been irresponsibly and publicly disclosed as zero days and also regardless of how bad they are. So like, you know, somebody discloses a vulnerability that, you know, has the pizza come out cold. Oh, that's a zero day. Oh, okay. That's a CVE of 10, baby. <laughs> that's, that's critical, man. Don't mess with that. <laughs> you know, but okay. So that's what Microsoft wants to call them. I can see their point since the race is then on to get the world patched before the publicly disclosed vulnerability can be weaponized and actively deployed. So I accept their definition in this case. And that also means that a total of six unexploited but published zero day vulnerabilities, as they want to call them, were also fixed last week. So overall, the breakdown by type was 41 elevation of privilege vulnerabilities, and we know those are bad once you gain a foothold. 29 remote code ex execution vulnerabilities, obviously never good. Nine security feature bypass vulnerabilities, which <laughs> could be anything. Nine denial of service vulnerabilities, which mostly means it's easy to crash something. Six information disclosure vulnerabilities, something leaks. And three spoofing vulnerabilities. Okay, and separately, those six unexploited but published zero days, as they call them, which were patched were, and remember there was a mention of open source, there was the open source curl remote code execution vulnerability. We'll, we'll, we'll look at that in a minute. It's not clear to me how that executes remote code. It's, it's in, interestingly funky. But anyway, there's also a live archive remote code execution vulnerability definitely looks like you could execute code with that one then four both of those are the open the two open source ones then we have windows user profile service elevation or privilege windows certificate spoofing windows event tracing discretionary access control list you know dacl dacl denial of service so that crashes something and windows security center api remote code execution okay those first two, as I said, curl and live archive, uh, which are the only remote code execution problems among those six, had already been fixed by their maintainers, but the fixes had not yet been incorporated into Windows until last Tuesday. So 
last Tuesday's Patch Tuesday updated Windows use of those, Windows inclusion of those. Now, reading the details of the curl problem, it's unclear, as I said, how it have, could like offer remote code execution. Here's what they said. When curl version greater than or equal to 7.20 and less than or equal to the one that fixed it, 7.78.0, connects to an IMAP or POP, so this is curl, connecting to an IMAP or POP3 email server to retrieve data using start TLS to upgrade the connection's TLS security, the server can respond and send back multiple responses at once that curl caches. Curl would then upgrade to TLS, but not flush the in queue of cached responses. Instead, continue using and trusting the responses it got before the TLS handshake as if they were authenticated. Using this flaw, it allows a man-in-the-middle attacker to first inject the fake responses, then pass through the TLS traffic from the legitimate server and trick curl into sending back data to the user under the assumption that the attacker's injected data comes from the TLS-protected server. Okay, so that's a cool hack, right? Somebody figured out that, you know, Curl is going to want to elevate its uh, its security to TLS, assuming that the IMAP or POP3 server in the hello handshake indicated that it supports start TLS. And so that would happen. So this is a very subtle and clever bug that comes about as a side effect of the start TLS kludge, which is really what it was. You know, it was the original way of providing email encryption over the traditional SMTP, IMAP, and POP ports before they obtained their own dedicated TLS connection ports, which they have now. And it's exactly the sort of bug that tends to creep into systems that were being pushed to do things they were not originally designed to do, such as on-the-fly switching an unencrypted connection to using encryption. Okay, so that's the curl bug. And as I said, someone claimed that it could be used for remote code execution, though didn't explain in this disclosure how that could be so. It just looked like you could get some, you know, a bad guy, a man in the middle, could sneak some stuff in uh, into an email client query that didn't actually come from the then authenticated server. But the live archive bug affecting versions 3.4.1 through 3.5.1 is a use after free flaw in its copy string function when called from either do uncompress block or process block. So that one might well be leveraged for remote code execution if a bad guy found some way to get the user or the system to use live archive to decompress a specially and maliciously formed archive. That one, I believe. In any event, patching should not be postponed since many of these already do have proof of concept exploits published. Remember, they're Microsoft zero days. And as we often observe, attacks never get worse. They only ever get better. Mostly, though, compared to other things going on right now, this is certainly not a four-alarm fire. So, you know, not for that reason. Oh, and if you encountered some of last week's breathless, oh, my God, patch now, Windows contains a wormable flaw press coverage, the reason I didn't lead with it is that for Windows IIS server to be vulnerable to it, which is what that breathless press coverage was about, requires enabling an obscure and non-default registry key under services, you know, current control set services, HTTP parameters, you need to have someone needs to have enabled uh, something called enable trailer support and set that to one. 
We're all familiar with the way HTTP headers work, where they form metadata such as cookie information, an asset's creation timestamp, probably its lifetime before expiration, you know, like, you know, how long the client is allowed to cache it before explicitly checking to see if it's been updated and so on. Well, it turns out that it's also possible, who knew, for additional headers, in this case called trailers, to be included after a chunked style encoded query or response. Just a few weeks ago, we clearly covered chunk styled encoding because that came up in something we were talking about. Okay, so you can have headers after the content? Okay, what? This really feels like the HTTP designers ran out of important work to do and sat around asking themselves, uh, what else can we add? You know, and that, that never ends well. So they invented a previously unappreciated need suggesting that it might be that a client or a server would not be able to fully form its query or response headers until after the body of the query or the response had been formed. No one knows why that might be true, <laughs> but hey, it could happen. Remember that since the dawn of the web, this had never actually apparently been a problem, but perhaps they got their important work finished early so they decided to define a solution for this one anyway. So yes, it turns out since HTTP 1.1, in addition to headers, it's also possible to have trailers. But as I said, Windows IIS server does not have that feature turned on by default. And since no one actually uses trailers, it's unclear why anyone would have ever turned it on. But okay, until last Tuesday, if someone had actually turned it on, then yes, IIS could theoretically be exploited by leveraging some mishandling in its non-default enabled support for HTTP's unused and unnecessary trailers feature. Now, as for that flaw being wormable, it seems to me that requires somewhere for the worm to go. And if no one else running IIS has that unused and unneeded and disabled feature enabled, that's going to be one lonely wannabe worm desperately trying to propagate. Which kind of reminds me of my adolescence. Anyway, despite not, all of not this... reproduce, propagate. <laughs> <laughs> despite all of this... Since we all agree that worms are bad, and since the attack complexity is quite low, this non-threat earned itself a CVSS of 9.8. So that alone must be what the other tech press saw yeah. and thought, oh my God. The pizza's going to be cold. <laughs> it is going to be it's a be very so cold. <laughs> cold pizza. Now, actually... I've been told cold pizza can be quite tasty. It is. So it's an excellent maybe breakfast that treat. Wasn't the, <laughs> wasn't the best <laughs> example to use. In any event, what was never a huge problem is no longer any problem. Well, it might be. That was Patch Tuesday's good news. Here's the other shoe. As Threat Post headlined their coverage, Microsoft yanks buggy Windows server updates. So maybe there's hope for that worm after all. Threat Post wrote, Since their release on Patch Tuesday, the updates have been breaking Windows, causing spontaneous boot loops on Windows domain controller servers, breaking Hyper-V, and making uh, the uh, REFS volume systems unavailable. <laughs> Whoa, Microsoft has yanked the Windows Server updates it issued on Patch Tuesday after admins found that the updates had critical bugs that broke th those three things. P 
people who were quite frustrated were venting all over Twitter. I saw one posting <laughs> asking the question, does Microsoft even test these things before releasing them? Uh, there was actually a great deal of frustration. I heard about this directly from many of our listeners and Twitter followers. In addition, it's been confirmed that Tuesday's updates for Windows 10 desktop machines were also breaking L2TP VPN connections. They no longer worked. Bleeping Computer was tracking this saga day to day and blow by blow on thursday they reported that microsoft had pulled the january windows server cumulative updates and were no longer accessible accessible via windows update but as of that afternoon microsoft had reportedly not also pulled the windows 10 and windows 11 cumulative updates that were breaking l2tp vpn connections and that was confirmed so it's unclear how that went. This is all the mixed blessing of Windows updates recently. We're pushed to install them immediately with breathless, though in this instance unwarranted warnings of the sky falling from a server worm. But installing these things through most of 2021 and continuing that trend into 2022 has resulted in the loss of mission critical functionality. So, Damned if you do, damned if you don't. Actually, don't appears the increasingly attractive option given Microsoft's recent side effect laden updates. You know, let somebody else go there first, see if they survive. And if so, then cautiously follow.